hour of just meditation. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to move on now to the panel discussion. So uh, Jane, if you wouldn't mind uh, joining everybody else at the table there. Um, um, many of you have uh, 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 written down questions for us, and uh, we'll be happy to answer those. Any, uh, any more uh, index cards that I can collect? Uh, do I have all of them? OK, great. So all right. All right. So um, first question I have is, are clinical trials or immunotherapy treatments universal and accessible by all hospitals? For instance, I will be offered, will I be offered the same options at my hospital in Connecticut, uh, or do I have to be a patient at Dana-Farber? Well, uh, I think the answer is, is uh, twofold. One is that there are certain immunotherapies that are FDA approved. Um, and for esophageal and gastric cancer, um, really the approval is in after a prior therapy. So uh, if you have an adenocarcinoma, uh, and you've received prior therapy, uh, pembrolizumab uh, is approved uh, for this disease. And for esophageal adenocarcinomas, uh, the NCCN guidelines and other, um, other groups have endorsed the extension of uh, this indication up into the esophagus based on Adam Bass's work, actually, uh, because it's uh, thought to be the same type of cancer. Um, so we really, uh, uh, for both esophageal and gastric adenocarcinoma, as long as you've received uh, prior therapies uh, and your tumor has a good immunoprofile, being pdl one positive, this is FDA approved. For squamous cell carcinoma, the indication is a little bit tougher. Uh, you actually have to have a CPS score of 10 or higher. Um, but as Adam uh, uh, quite uh, 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 intelligently pointed out to me, the FDA actually, in their wisdom, um, uh, s uh, states that you can be retested um, for this. And so if you don't meet the criteria up front, another biopsy, another test may actually show that you are now um, uh, have a better immunoprofile and would qualify for this study. What do you uh, retest and what do you apply for? you would get another biopsy of the tumor. And uh, we would generally recommend, first of all, a safe biopsy site, but also one that does not, uh, one of the sites that doesn't appear to be responding to, to therapy. And once you get the biopsy, what do you Then you would check once again for, we would recommend a pdl one testing with a CPS score. It's a, it's a, stands for combined prognostic score. Uh, any, uh, any hospital should be able to do that, um, and um, there are also freestanding laboratories uh, that uh, do this testing. So your doctor, uh, an oncologist, should have no problems ordering this. So. Um, I believe that, uh, uh, so for instance, this gives you another opportunity to be, to be tested. Um, uh, but the insurance companies may limit the number of biopsies you get. Um, ultimately, it'll come down to that they won't pay for it, but you can obviously pay it for it yourself. So, um, Okay, um, the next question uh, is for Dr. Jaju. Um, Omeprazole, CBS has put out uh, an alarming notice about polyps developing. Uh, well, maybe the bigger picture you could discuss about the concerns with long-term use of omeprazole. Sure. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of data regarding the long-term use of omeprazole. Somebody had rightly pointed out that it's, it's uh, <laughs> prescribed pretty, or not even prescribed, but purchased pretty freely uh, everywhere. Um, <clears throat> I think the most important thing is that we're putting patients on it for the right reason. We're not um, blindly renewing an old prescription uh, and making sure that people need to be on it. If patients are having it for, or, or were prescribed it or started taking it just for some abdominal discomfort that wasn't in treatment of true acid reflux or of Barrett's esophagus, then they should not continue on the medication. There's been data for a number of side effects, um, chronic kidney disease, dementia, uh, acute coronary syndrome, um, C. diff in patients who go to the hospital on omeprazole. 
has all been shown to be at somewhat increased risk uh, compared to people who are not on omeprazole. That being said, some of the data has been refuted in subsequent studies. Um, I had, unfortunately, a number of tearful conversations with the patients saying, why did you give me this medication if it causes dementia? Didn't you know that my mother had dementia? And a one year, literally one year later, a study came out saying that it does not have any association with dementia and might even protect against dementia if you look uh, at, at some way of looking at the statistics. So I think that, you know, we know that it is um, not candy. It is not uh, something that should be taken lightly. Um, we know that it should, it, it is likely safe enough to be over the counter, but if it is going to be taken uh, long term, should be discussed with a physician. Um, the story about polyps, uh, the way that it works is by blocking the proton pump inhibitor, uh, uh, excuse me, by inhibiting the proton pump, um, um, the hydrogen uh, potassium ATPase, and when that is blocked, the body wonders why, so it upregulates the signal towards making more acid. So it upregulates gastrin. And when you have upregulation of gastrin, um, the cells that are trying to make acid will become a bit more engorged by that stimulus, and that creates polyps. Those polyps are benign, um, but, but can grow and can be seen. They're not the same as polyps in, this, in the colon uh, or elsewhere in the body. So yes, there are data uh, about side effects of long-term use of proton pump inhibitors. We should not be giving them blindly, but we also know that in patients with Barrett's esophagus, it reduces the progression to um, esophageal cancer. So there is a subgroup of patients who will likely need to stay on it, um, and if you should be discussing with your doctor if you need it long-term, and if not, uh, trying to be tapered off of it. Of course, the caveat to that now comes out a couple of weeks ago where to taper off of it, you may need to take ranitidine, and ranitidine has been found to have a very small uh, portion of NDMA, which is a uh, carcinogen, um, and has been pulled from the shelves of CVS as well. So you can't win. Um, if you looked at the box from the last thing you ordered from Amazon, it probably has a sticker on it that says that California considers something in this product to, to be a carcinogen, uh, and probably at a greater rate than what's, in the, what's been found in the ranitidine. Uh, we, we don't really know. Um, so uh, I think we have to be mindful of any medication, even if it's over the counter, uh, but when utilized correctly and with conversations with your physician, uh, for the benefit greater than the risk, that, that's always what we have to discuss. And the reality is that a lot of our patients really couldn't live without uh, proton pump inhibitors, omeprazole, and other drugs. They're so miserable, they have such severe heartburn uh, that it's really the only thing that's actually saving them from having a, an absolutely miserable life. So it is, as Dr. Juju said, it's risk-benefit and, um, you know, in a patient who, or a person who probably has very little symptoms and, and very mild problems, perhaps it's not the best long-term drug, but many of our patients have such severe problems that there's really no other choice. Our next question is for James. Are trials dependent on where one gets treated? Does DFCI and other hospital patients have the same access? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, what I would say is uh, all across the country, there's many, many trials going on. And uh, particularly at large academic centers, um, we all have different portfolios of trials. Um, so in some of the trials, for, for example, the FGFR trial that Peter is running, it is found in other hospitals all over the country, and other trials are not. Um, really, the best way I would answer that question is, because these things are all in trials, we don't know which one's better right now. And, and so, um, if there was a trial that was worth traveling for, I think your oncologist would tell you. Otherwise, I think doing the trial um, where you are is probably the best strategy because there's a lot of um, challenges traveling long term to go to places. I think the other part of that, because I said large academic centers, there was a question before about someone from Connecticut, and I was thinking, well, a good place in Connecticut is Yale. The, the person who ran the GI cancer group here at the Farber now runs Yale. So Yale's a fantastic place. Memorial Sloan Kettering's a fantastic place. But there's a lot of people all over the country who don't have the luxury of going to a large academic center like this. This is something the oncology community um, is aware of. We realize it's a problem. Um, but right now, we don't have a great fix. We're working very hard to get there. But for um, small private practices in, in rural areas, it's hard to get access to trials. Um, so in those, for those patients, like we see a lot of patients here who commute down 
from Maine and New Hampshire just because they don't have a lot of large academic centers in those communities. For those, for those cases, yeah, I think if there's a trial that, that seems promising, I think it is worthwhile uh, going to. But otherwise, I would just try to find a trial in a large academic center near, near where you live. Um, this, I think, is a question uh, that uh, had been asked before, but just to reiter reiterate it, um, it's asked, where can we see the broadcast? And again, uh, this uh, will be, is, a, is being currently webcast, and it will be stored both on the Dana-Farber website uh, for the Center for Esophageal and Gastric Cancer, and also on the Debbie's uh, Dream uh, website. So uh, there's two possibilities for you to uh, Hear things again if perhaps you missed something or you wanted to hear it again. Um, question for me, I think, uh, in the slide on standard of care, uh, the benefit of treatments for PDL1 positive showed some benefit for PDL1 negative. What's the threshold? Well, this is controversial because um, really the truth is that although PDL1 is currently being used sort of to differentiate between who uh, has a better chance of responding and who doesn't, it's really an imperfect test. Uh, and the reality is that we need better tests to determine who's going to respond to immunotherapy and who isn't. And as the person correctly pointed out, there were clearly patients who were PDL1 negative who had great responses to therapy. In fact, this past week I saw a gentleman who was PDL1 negative, and he has been in remission now for three years uh, on the Keynote 62 study. He would currently not be able to get this drug because it's not FDA approved for PDL1 negative disease. So yes, there is a chance, but it's diminishing returns. If you think about it, if only 6% of patients respond, um, that's, uh, that's, those are tough odds. But uh, as Jane was saying earlier, hope, uh, it's important to have hope. And uh, you know, if there aren't any better treatment options, then that's something that uh, could still be considered. And this is why, as Adam pointed out, we would recommend retesting uh, to see if uh, the new sample is PD-L1 positive. The other point to make is that, um, uh, is that uh, tumors are highly variable, and it really depends on where you biopsy the site. Maybe Adam could talk about the variability in, in hot spots and, and things like that. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think this is um, an important question. I think, well, there's, there's the variability of PD-L1 um, uh, expression, which I think is one important question. Um, and there's also the variability in the genome, which is another question. So you know, definitely there's, there are um, different ways that cancer genomes get messed up in different classes of cancer. And I think the way that the bulk of gastric and esophageal adenocarcinomas get messed up. It is very prone to some of the important uh, driving oncogenes, the targets we care about, to be somewhat heterogeneous. So we definitely know that there are situations where if you biopsy left versus right, you'll get different results um, in terms of whether someone's HER2 positive or FGFR2 positive uh, and so forth. Um, so I think we need to understand what that means because the, I think what's clear is that the best cancer target would be a target that's in all of the cancer cells. Um, I think that goes without saying. And so it, it also means that in some gastric and esophageal cancers, if we don't have a clear target that's in all the cancer cells, we have to start thinking about other classes of targets that are uh, different types of approaches that would hit everything. Um, so that's where we're thinking for the future, but in terms of uh, right now, I think it, it does, you know, I think it's an open question of how much this variation over space, you know, should guide therapy. And I think there are definitely, there have been patients where the biopsy of the esophageal primary was HER2 negative, but a liver metastasis was HER2 positive. And there are people who have benefited from getting a repeat biopsy of the liver and finding the HER2 that was missing in the primary who got Herceptin who wouldn't otherwise have got that. Um, you know, but we don't have enough data yet to know for sure. Um, and we also don't know if, it, if that patient with um, 
part of the tumor was HER2 positive, part was HER2 negative. Does that just mean that as you give the Herceptin a few months later, that part that's HER2 negative is going to have, you know, that growth advantage, and then you're going to be facing that, you know, that easily is, um, you know, a possibility. But it's, um, you know, again, that's, um, you know, that's uh, why we sort of view this as a game of chess, and we have to think about learning and looking at the chessboard as it changes over time. Um, um, and I think that's, uh, I think, where the field is moving, which, unfortunately, you know, I, um, you know, as a scientist, I'm thinking of both about what we do for five years from now when also patients want to know about what to do five minutes from now. Um, but, you know, we're trying to um, balance these things. But um, I would say right now there's definitely strong consideration for looking at multiple regions or considering things like blood biopsies for this reason, with that caveat is that we're just learning what to do with this information now and we don't have all the answers. Yeah. May I have a follow-up question? Yes. So how, as a patient, I have um, stage four metastasis, stage three, nodes, tumor there. How do, uh, should I, as a patient, advocate for the patient advocating for myself, look for a second biopsy of the distant metastasization? I'm PDL negative. I'm f coming to the end of the full fox, probably. So the next treatment is less clear. Should yeah. I be looking? Should I be, be thinking of this as uh, as a novice two cancers, or is it one? You know, is the distant metastasization to be thought of differently than the core tumor in my esophagus? You know, I you know I would think think of this sort of kind of as a family tree, um, you know, um, um, you know, that basically, you know, at some point there was a cancer cell and that cell divided and that cell divided and that, you know, and then to the point where you have a cancer that you could see on a CT scan, you know, you've had all of these changes over time and part of, part of uh, what happens in cancer is that, you know, is that the ability to make DNA errors gets even greater. So, you, you know, then you, you know the 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 cell a hundred times cell division later has a lot of what that first cancer had. It has, but then it's it's evolved some other changes. So it's not that necessarily it's two different cancers, but that these things evolve over time, and that um, the way they evolve can be impacted by what happens. So you know if you have just for example, you know if you have a you know a tumor and some cells are HER2 positive, some cells are HER2 negative, you give a HER2 inhibitor, it makes sense that the cells that are HER2 negative are going to have an advantage compared, and so that over time those are going to out, 